uh, Jessica, I wanted to take uh, your views on this. Uh, you know, of course, I want to stick with the corridor, and we were discussing this earlier as well. Uh, the fact that it's called the India Middle East Europe right. Economic <laughs> Corridor. The Middle East is a very, uh, it's a term which is mostly used in uh, the American side. Uh, yeah. What kind of influence did do you feel US had on the corridor and otherwise also with the joint declaration getting a unanimous consensus? What can, just weigh in on that, you know, what kind of Well, first on the corridor, uh, I think this is something that the United States would say it's been working on uh, for at least 18 months. There was, of course, that right. meeting between the National Security Advisors in May uh, from India, the uh, Saudis, the uh, Americans, uh, and I believe the... Uh, the UAE were all there. But even before that, um, you know, we, we had a guest yesterday on your broadcast, a former ambassador to the UAE from India, who said this is very much in line with the conversations we were having with the I2, U2, which is India, Israel, United States, UAE, and uh, a conception of increasing connectivity. Of course, diplomatically for the Americans, this is really key to achieve their objective of normalizing relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. It hasn't come through yet. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, positive movement, but this is positive movement because they're going to be at the same table talking about making this very ambitious project go forward. So even though uh, we don't have a timeline, we don't have a cost projection on what this looks like in, in terms of actually becoming reality, diplomatically it's already a victory for the U.S. because this is something they've been working towards. Right. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, of course, uh, you're right here with us. I want to now cut across to our guest, uh, Su Yung Oh. Uh, so she's a South Korean senior presidential correspondent at Erang TV. I hope I'm getting the pronunciations correctly. Pardon me if I've got that wrong. Uh, Su Yung, tell us about, uh, you know, how is uh, the G20 summit and all the developments from day one? How have they been perceived in the South Korean area? And uh, of course, you know, relations between US and South Korea have only grown in the past as we've seen. There is a lot happening in the Korean Peninsula. I won't get into it that much, but uh, talk to us about what kind of reactions have there been in the region and also what kind of resilience do you feel would be coming in from the Chinese side given all the developments on day one? Yeah, well, as you've clearly perceived, there's been quite a lot going on, uh, right. not just uh, in within the uh, sessions, the official sessions of the G20 summit, but the uh, geopolitical movement surrounding it as well. And for South Korea, observing the G20 uh, sessions, let's begin with that. It's been an, incre an incredible op opportunity for Seoul to really participate and expand its multilateral diplomacy from the view of the South Korean president uh, anyway, as he tries to really engage with the Indo-Pacific region, where, of course, um, India is a, is a substantial actor. And President Yoon himself has uh, emphasized that India is a core partner that uh, shares South Korea's common values, which includes uh, freedom and democracy. And on that note, he's very eager to also work with India and uh, get put these uh, visions into action in terms of really uh, pursuing uh, freedom, peace, prosperity in the world with the sort of uh, outcomes that we saw at the G20 yesterday when the leaders managed to agree on that communicate a very positive reaction as well because uh, here as well because well to be honest there was some there was some extent of uh, pessimism surrounding whether yes. such a document could be adopted you know perhaps there wouldn't have been a consensus for the first time since the G20 was launched in 2008 but that wasn't the case and uh, I think we really think that uh, it was due to India's kind of um, adroitness and uh, agility in getting these diplomatic uh, tensions, straightening them out so that uh, really there could be a document that every that isn't uh, to the detail that everyone might want, but it, it is something to work on and a uh, unanimous consensus. That, so positive reaction, exactly. Right, a unanimous consensus. I don't think uh, that was really expected because there were a lot of hiccups which were coming in. The Sherpas were working overnight, burning that midnight oil, trying to get to a point. Then there was all that, uh, you know, uh, you and cry about the Ukraine paragraph being left empty. And then finally there was a joint consensus and it was a one bigger development after another on day one. Molly, I want to cut back to you. Uh, the one future session is going to be starting a little later in the day. Can you talk to us about what to expect on day two with this session? Well, uh, Shivan, uh, before that, let's just also talk about uh, what the first two sessions, uh, ahead, one, yes. uh, one Earth and One Family, right. uh, focused on. And um, 
you know, talking about the various themes that are involved here. And these are issues that are very close uh, to uh, India's uh, presidency message, which is to get countries on board uh, to fight climate, uh, to fight the climate crisis, uh, to, uh, find, uh, to try and find uh, solutions to uh, the challenges that we are facing at this point and uh, the push for inclusivity and emerging as the voice of the global south. And these are all uh, fundamental to the message that India has been trying to send out throughout its presidency and throughout its uh, negotiations as well. And uh, speak specifically about the way in which it has tried to arrive at consensus uh, when it comes to issues like climate change and that's something that has been lauded as well because let's face it uh, whether or not countries are taking the issue of climate uh, or the issue of the climate crisis seriously enough that's something that has been talked about time and again and uh, tripling uh, the uh, global renewable energy capacity by the year 2030 uh, being uh, something that uh, has emerged as a huge milestone uh, because uh, getting those commitments uh, in place and uh, charting out uh, the road ahead as far as uh, uh, the global push to fight the climate crisis is concerned and India spearheading those efforts and talking about how uh, the burden needs to be shared equally uh, because like uh, many of the experts we've been talking to have been telling us uh, the very fact that the vulnerable countries are paying the price for those who are causing most of the emissions has been a huge sticking point as well. So just uh, ironing out those differences and getting everybody on the same page is, some, is something that India has been pushing for throughout as well. Uh, talking about uh, uh, the other two sessions uh, which have primarily hinged on uh, getting the countries uh, uh, on board when it comes to again the overarching theme being meeting the global challenges a very interesting factor here has been uh, india's push for uh, inclusivity like we mentioned uh, which found uh, resonance in uh, the formal induction of the african union as a part of the g20 the first time the grouping is being expanded uh, to include that uh, 55 member block uh, uh, this move also being of huge significance and again speaking volumes of the message that India has been trying to send out. Molly, thank you.